Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast. This is Thought Leaders with Joe Craig. My guest today is James Fenelon, author of Four Hours of Fury, the untold story of World War II's largest airborne invasion and the final push into Nazi Germany. James Fenelon served in the military for over a decade, and he's a graduate of the U.S. Army's Airborne, Jumpmaster, and Pathfinder schools. He's a regular contributor to World War II magazine, and his knowledge of military history has made him a sought-after technical advisor for video games, screenplays, and documentary creation. A graduate of the University of Texas at Austin, he and his wife live in Texas, and Four Hours of Fury is his first book. So James, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Joe. I appreciate being here. Great. So we mentioned your Army background. So how did you go from jumping out of planes to writing this book? Well, it's actually the, the two are, are pretty, pretty much related. So I had first learned of Operation Varsity when I was going through jump school at Fort Benning back in 1988. At that time, the, the infantry museum was on post. And I remember seeing a, a small display on the airborne operations uh, from World War II in the, in the European theater. And at the very end of that list was Operation Varsity, the jump across the Rhine. And I had never really heard of it before in all of my high school history classes didn't, didn't cover it. And it was just, it always stuck with me. And as I continued through my military career, and then after I got out, um, World War II airborne history became a passion, a uh, you know, hobby of mine. And as I continued to look into that, I found that there was a gap really in, in the historical record of American airborne operations in Europe because Operation Varsity wasn't really covered. Mm -hmm. Um, in the official army history, in the Green Book series, I think there's a total of 10 pages kind of dedicated to it. I couldn't really find any book specifically dedicated to it. There were a couple self-published veterans accounts. Right. And uh, one day as I was complaining about the dearth of material, my wife made the comment, why don't you just write the book that you keep <laughs> looking for? And so that kind of began uh, the, the process, if you will, of starting to document the operation. Sounds great. Now, you know, much of the book uh, that you have, it focuses on the 17th Airborne Division uh, with Major General William Miley. Uh, he's obviously one of the pioneers, uh, had formed the first parachute group. Tell us, uh, tell us listeners about, uh, about his background and his contributions to airborne culture and history. Absolutely. Yeah. General Miley, through the process of writing this book, really became, became kind of an inspiration for me and kind of one of the themes for the story and, of course, for the airborne troops back in World War II that were kind of basically making it up as they went along. They had to invent their own procedures and tactics. And Miley was really instrumental in that. He had graduated from West Point right after World War I. And it, it's telling that he spent the first 15 years of his career as a lieutenant, which kind of really shows how small the Army was right. in the interwar years. Um, he used that time well to his advantage, attending as much education as possible, improving his uh, skill set as a soldier, and was well positioned when the Army started to expand in the late 30s, anticipating what was going to happen in Europe and potentially Asia. Um, he went through jump school and became, as you mentioned, commander of the 501st uh, Parachute Infantry Battalion at that point, mm -hmm. um, which was the first organized um, unit in the Army dedicated to, to parachute troops. He pioneered a lot of the, um, the equipment that they used, really set some of the standards around leading by example, which uh, when he jumped with combat equipment for the first time, ended up uh, breaking a collarbone. So right. he was uh, he very much set that that leadership position that, that we still uh, know today uh, in the traditions of, of the airborne community. And he was responsible for some of the look, right? That's, that's right. That's a good point. Yeah, he uh, felt that, you know, he really wanted a unit of uh, that had a high esprit de corps that recognized themselves as the elite that they were. And so he was instrumental in um, uh, sending General or Captain Yarbrough at the time to Washington, D.C. to work with the War Department to get the jump wings, the design of the jump wings approved. Mm -hmm. He also encouraged his men to modify their uniform by wearing jump boots instead of the low quarters with their uniform and some other, and other blousing things. The to trousers, blousing the trousers. Blousing the boots to give them the distinct look, which uh, set them on a, a crash course trajectory with the other elite troops at, at the time, which were uh, tankers. And so there was a lot of uh, spirited fights uh, in town. A little bit of people. rivalry with the, the legs, right? That's right, just a little bit. All right. So, you know, moving to the book then, you know, we, we first see the 17th uh, coming into play with the Battle of the Bulge, 
where Patton selects him to guard his flank for the the counterattack at a Bastogne, and which Patton said was like may have been the best decision he made in the war. Um, and then that leads to the, the preparation for Operation Varsity. So, uh, can you just give us an overview of like where the war is? What what's what is Varsity intended to do? What are its objectives? Sure. So after. After the 17th was withdrawn from Belgium as part of the, the Battle of the Bulge, they, uh, like several of the other airborne divisions that had participated in the Battle of the Bulge, had suffered almost 4,000 casualties. And so they were withdrawn back into France um, just to, to recuperate in several several villages around um, outside of, I'm sorry, let me start that over. They were withdrawn um, back into France to recuperate at several rest camps um, not far from, from Paris. They then incorporated uh, they incorporated replacement troops to kind of bolster their ranks. And meanwhile, while that's happening, the Allies are continuing to grind forward towards Germany, towards the east. And Eisenhower had really uh, was a strong advocate of the broad front. So using the Allied might at this point that had built up to, I think, something like 25 divisions were, were moving forward. And Eisenhower was a fan of this broad front strategy that kept the Germans off guard. It didn't really give them the opportunity to build their reserves in any one location because they were constantly having to react to the Allies just... Right. Moving forward. Um, the one exception to that was the desire to cross the Rhine River up near the Ruhr industrial area. And this is really where um, Germans industrial might was centered. Lots of factories. This is where they were still cranking out aircraft and, and even U-boats that mm -hmm. this late in the war. And so even while the Allies were moving forward, they knew that one of the keys to ending the war in Germany was to cut off this industrial capacity. And that task was given to um, Field Marshal Montgomery, British mm -hmm. officer, who came up with the plan to cross the Rhine. Um, further north from Remagen, which of course is where the Americans had crossed the Rhine and were able to um, get a get an intact bridge for a couple of days before it collapsed. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that the terrain in that area wasn't conducive to the breakout that the Allies had in mind to sweep through and encircle the Rhine and cut right. off, like I said, that industrial capacity. And so as part of that, Montgomery came up with Operation Plunder, which was a wide um, frontal assault across the Rhine in his area with five divisions. As part of that, he wanted um, several airborne divisions to drop on the far side of the Rhine to kind of establish a bridgehead, if you will, mm -hmm. and to uh, not only establish a protective perimeter for his troops coming across, but also seize some vital bridges across the Issel Canal, which those bridges were necessary to not only block German counterattacks from coming in and coming over those bridges, but also they wanted those bridges intact as a way to then launch themselves out of the bridgehead and into yeah. uh, deeper into Germany. I mean, we saw how important the bridges were in uh, Operation Market Garden. That's right. right. Very similar concept uh, to getting those bridges intact as much as possible. And, and speaking of Market Garden, you know, it seems like a lot of the lessons learned there were applied to the operation planning for varsity. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's absolutely right. There was um, a lot of uh, internal review after Market Garden to understand exactly what happened and what lessons could be learned from that. That was uh, summarized in a several page document and, of course, in, into the Allied strategy of how they wanted to use their airborne troops. One of one of those lessons learned was to drop them closer to the uh, advancing troops as an advance can't ever necessarily be predicted. The Germans are always going to have a vote in this case as to uh, what, what might unfold there. Mm -hmm. And the other big one was they wanted to make sure that they dropped them within uh, friendly artillery range. And so Montgomery, as part of his plunder plan, had uh, over 5,000 artillery pieces, in some cases lined up wheel to wheel on the Allied side of the Rhine, which gave uh, the airborne troops landing on the far side of the Rhine almost immediate um, artillery support upon landing. Right. And having them that close and, and you know, landing all within just one one drop one day, you know, you don't have the problems where people are being abandoned, like in, in Market Garden. That's a great point. The other the other lesson that they wanted to integrate into Operation Varsity was the single lift instead of instead of bringing it in over several days like they did at Market Garden, which was interrupted due to weather and other constraints, uh, which is what ended up giving Varsity the, the title of the largest single day drop in World War II. It was uh, an armada of over 1,500 transport planes, over 1,300 gliders, 500 fighter escorts. And then on the tail of that were 240 B-24s bringing in supplies. And right. that, that was another component that they um, they wanted the supplies to be there um, on the tail end of the drop in case, again, of delays that the airborne troops could sustain themselves. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and, and speaking of the gliders, it, you know, this operation sees the introduction of uh, a new type, the uh, a new uh, you know plane coming in, the C forty six Commando. And you also see the new uh, recoilless rifle, the M eighteen, which is kind of the improvement of the bazooka. So, can you tell a little, little bit about how those uh, were a factor in the in the fighting? Yeah. Um, so again, in that spirit of kind of innovation and constantly looking to how to improve improve their tactics, the C forty six was uh, a new aircraft into Europe. They actually expedited the the pilots' transition training in order to get uh, a full squadron available for. Varsity, it had the advantage of it could carry twice as many troops and it had double doors on it. So mm-hmm. the C-47, which was the, the workhorse of cargo transport planes in World War II, had a single door, which meant that, you know, you had to go through that single door. It could only carry around 18 combat equipped jumpers. The C-46 allowed you to almost jump a full platoon going out both doors. They could clear the aircraft, I think, in something like 12 seconds if they, had, uh, if they had their hustle on, mm-hmm. which of course meant they landed closer together, which made them a more effective fighting unit once they landed. Mm-hmm. So that was an important innovation. Now, unfortunately, the uh, C-46 did not have the self-sealing gas tanks that the C-47 had, which resulted in a lot of fatalities um, from from anti aircraft um, fire as those as those planes came in and dropped their 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 uh, sticks of paratroopers, mm-hmm. a lot of them uh, came under fire and, and immediately caught fire because of the the gas tank situation. Right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the writing in the book is so vivid, talking about their experiences and the flight over. And, you know, a lot of the connections to the actual gear. So, you know, the, there was one part where you talk about a guy had put a grenade in his pocket and the shock of the canopy opening, they just like ripped right through the bottom of the jacket pockets or troopers bringing wool blankets so they could fold it up and put it on the bench underneath them just for a little bit of extra protection against flak. So can you take us through the preparation for battle? What, what were they doing ahead of time and what are they thinking as they're heading over into battle? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I wanted to explore with this book is to really tell it from the perspective of the trooper on the ground, right? And it kind of juxtapose that against the 18th Airborne Corps working with Montgomery on the planning. And you kind of, you know, you see that these guys on the ground in the 17th Airborne Division don't really know what's coming. They've got some indication that certainly they're going to be used for an airborne operation. There's a lot of speculation as to when and where. And so these guys don't really have a strong influence on their own future, right? But right. one thing that any soldier can do to prepare themselves is to prepare their gear, right? That's the one thing that they do have under their control to be as ready as possible for whatever eventuality comes their way by way of their their operation. And so the troopers of the 17th Airborne Division were no different. They spent a lot of time cleaning their weapons, sharpening their knives, making sure that they had the equipment at hand, making trade-off decisions around, well, do I carry more food or do I carry more ammo? Mm-hmm. Test fitting their parachutes to make sure, you know, before they rig up that everything is going to be secure and, and all the straps are sized correctly. And so one of the things that struck me as I, as I researched the book was just how much effort these guys did put into making sure that everything that they could control they did as much as possible, right? right? Whether at having their jump knife ready to cut themselves out of a tree if they needed it or, you know, agonizing decisions around, well, do I jump with my Thompson at the ready or do I, you know, have it secured in my equipment to so make sure I don't drop it? Mm-hmm. You know, all the little decisions to make sure that you're as ready as possible when you go out the door. Right. And so after those decisions are made, they're on the flight over, uh, you've got uh, the 507th is uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment. It's going to be the spearhead. And their commander, Edson Raff, is going to be the first guy to jump into Germany. Uh, but some of his group, called the Raff, Raff's Ruffians, uh, don't drop in the right place. So, you know, what happens? How do they deal with that? Yeah, uh, Raff, Raff became one of my favorite uh, characters as I, re- I wrote the book. Um, he had jumped into, he had, he had led the first combat jump into North Africa and was a very controversial figure, very outspoken. One of the things that uh, he carried forward with him was the lessons learned was all, always be ready. And, and that manifested itself for the 507th in that they were jumping a lot of heavy equipment when they when they jumped into Germany. They were jumping their radios on their person, mm-hmm. uh, the 30 caliber medium machine guns they were jumping on them, their person. Uh, these were traditionally the radios and, and machine guns were traditionally put in supply containers that were dropped from the bottom of the plane. Mm-hmm. Um, and the benefits of jumping with this heavy equipment, despite the guys grumbling about it, because of course it's a better, you know, it's an easier way to get injured by jumping with this heavy equipment. 
Um, to your point, when they missed drop, though, Raf was able to quickly orientate where they were, communicate with his other two battalions that had dropped on the correct drop zone because they had the radios on their person. They were right. able to quickly orientate themselves, get com get communications established. And he immediately kind of uh, on the fly, if you will, started reassigning units, uh, other battalions objectives based on proximity and the fact that they were already on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the 507th actually sees their objectives um, the fastest of the three regiments of the 517th that jumped that day because of RAF's kind of insistence on on these SOPs. Right. And one of the things that comes through the book is there's really a lot of good coordination between uh, infantry and artillery. So even though you had uh, Raf's, you know, some of his group landing in one in the wrong area, and the artillery goes into the correct spot in the drop zone. Uh, they they do coordinate quickly. Um, is that part of the connection? You know, like a personal relationship between uh, Brannigan and uh, you know, his, the Brannigan's bastards? And tell us about that. Yeah. So part of Raf's combat team was uh, Brannigan's bastards, or their their parachute field artillery battalion that was attached uh, to them for the drop. And so that was another interesting aspect of, of varsity and all, all of the airborne operations in World War II, frankly, was because we didn't have the aircraft that was large enough, they had to drop artillery pieces, 75 millimeter howitzers in several bundles. They had to disassemble the weapon, mm -hmm. pack it up into, into supply crates and then drop that into um, the drop zone and then reassemble it on the drop zone in order to get that that heavier firepower. But RAF and Brannigan did have uh, a unique relationship. They were both kind of considered outsiders. Brannigan had risen through the ranks. He had originally enlisted as a private in the New York National Guard before the war, mm -hmm. um, had become a commissioned officer at this point. And I, I was never really able to trace down um, the reasons behind him being considered an outsider with the division staff. Um, but Needless to say, when he arrived at the 507th and met Edson Raff, the two of them got along immediately. Um, maybe it's because Raff named his unit Raff's Ruffians <laughs> and Brannigan named his Brannigan's Bastards. And they immediately. I was wondering if there's a connection. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It just happened to come together like that. Had this rapport of, of you know, aggressive leadership style. And so as um, soon as um, Brannigan's men hit the drop zone, they had three of their howitzers burn in through uh, shoot malfunctions, but they were able to get their other howitzers put together pretty quickly mm -hmm. and immediately start kind of providing suppressive fire with their artillery. In a lot of cases, they were just sighting down directly down the barrel and taking out uh, German strongholds to kind of start pushing them back off of the drop zone. Right. You know, and, and you mentioned, you know, they, they were able to adjust on the fly to get their objectives. And it seems like pretty much everyone in uh, varsity, uh, with the possible exception of Ace Miller, you know, got to their objectives, uh, you know, very quickly and on time. So you, you'd have to say that varsity was a successful operation, but uh, there was some post-war criticism of the operation. Can you tell us about yeah, that? Yeah, um, sure. In in that in that official army history that I mentioned in those ten pages, there was some criticism or some debate rather around whether or not varsity was was necessary, and it it compared the the ground gained um, by the airborne troops, meaning the the depth of the bridgehead, and compared it to other. Um, advances on either flank of the, of the airborne bridgehead and, and made the comment that the ground gained wasn't necessarily um, worthy of the loss of, of the airborne troops. And there were a significant amount of casualties, I think, between the British 6th Airborne Division and the 17th Airborne Division. There were a little over 2,000 casualties um, as part of Operation Varsity. But one of the things that I learned through the research is going back and reading um, General Ridgway's 18th Airborne Corps diary, mm -hmm. um, General Dempsey, who was um, Montgomery's second in command, who was kind of directly responsible for the operation. Knighted on the battlefield, right? Knighted so, on the battlefield, uh, yeah. First um, time since Agincourt. <laughs> that's right, good memory. Um, the, the, the objective really wasn't in their mind as they were coming up with the plan for Varsity. One of the objectives was not a necessarily a greater depth of a bridgehead, but more it came down to those bridges and securing them intact. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the argument was, well, did you really need airborne troops to seize them? And of course, as I, as I mentioned in the book, you know, infantry or ground troops have been seizing objectives since the dawn of time. And right. so could those bridges have been seized? by ground troops before the Germans destroyed them, I, I don't think that they would have gotten there that fast. I think if the Germans had beaten them to the bridges, that that 
the Issel Canal would have provided an, another natural barrier. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that um, they chose that area to drop in was it was farm farmland, flat farmland. So maneuvering towards those bridges along the canal, once they'd been fortified by German troops, it would have been a fight no matter who was trying to get it. Right. And, and the canal, I mean, one of the other parts of the book that really stands out is uh, talking about the glider pilots and how rather than just being left on their own to, to make their way back to, to the rear, they were actually brought into the fight and they were involved with some of the fighting around the canal, right? That's right. Yeah. So one of the lessons learned from Market Garden was to better organize the glider pilots that had uh, infantry training, right? These were the kind of guys that once they landed, they were on the ground. Um, engineless gliders weren't going to be able to take off again, kind of the forerunners, if you will, of uh, air assault. And so they organized the gliders into provisional units and assigned them objectives. Um, in a lot of ways, they were there to relieve um, some of the glider infantry themselves to, mm -hmm. to send more men towards the, the canal while the glider pilots set up um, roadblocks and things like that on the inner perimeter, um, which freed up more troops to be on the front line. But the glider pilots did in many cases, and in the, in the case of Burp Gun Corner, which kind of was their um, first big battle at Varsity, um, found themselves their roadblock being attacked by a group of German infantry mm -hmm. with armor support. Right. And, and then, you know, after the, the little tough back and forth, you know, they, they secure the bridges and then it's, uh, you know, as Ridgeway says, it becomes a pursuit after that. So uh, it was a success, you know, it goes on, uh, you know, for the battle uh, to tie up the, the rear pocket. But uh, even for all its success, uh, you know, as you noted from the beginning, like not a lot of people know about varsity. And, um, you know, it's not as well covered as the Normandy jumps or, or Market Garden. So why, why do you think it, it hasn't got the attention? It's a great question. I, I've I've ruminated over that for a long time and I've come come to a couple of ideas behind that one. The 17th Airborne Division, like many of the other divisions uh, the American Army had, was formed right before the war and then was disbanded after the war. And so it had no lineage before the war. And except for a brief period in time when the 17th was brought back as a regular infantry division as a training unit in the 50s, mm -hmm. hasn't had any lineage since then. Hmm. And so I think a lot of ways the 17th was overshadowed by the 82nd and the 101st, which continue their, their, their great legacy today. And then secondly, Varsity was largely a British operation. So because it was commanded by uh, Montgomery, mm -hmm. and it took place technically in the in the British sector. There were a couple of American divisions that went across the Rhine as part of plunder, and then of course the 17th Airborne Division was dropped. Um, this is the lone American division that was dropped in support of a British operation. It also came close to the end of the war and probably got lost in the euphoria of uh, the end of the uh, V day. So VE comes day. To very shortly after, right? And then I also think there was a lot of misconceptions around the state of the German army at the end of the war. I mean, certainly they were short of manpower and short of gasoline, but they certainly weren't short of determination. And I think you could see that from the casualties and the fact that in the month of April, the last full month of the war, mm -hmm. the Americans suffered the same amount of casualties virtually as they had in June when they came ashore in France. And right. so the war didn't really peter out as, as people think, despite the, the Germans' more difficult capabilities or, or fulfilling their ranks. The fighting was still just as difficult to end the war as it was at the closer to the beginning of the campaign. Right. Well, it's, it's a great story, and, and I hope your book does uh, bring some more attention to the operation that it deserves. So, uh, James, I want to thank you for uh, being our guest today. Uh, and uh, readers, uh, the book is out there. It's uh, the new book again is called Four Hours of Fury. So, thank you, James. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. And uh, to all our listeners, thanks for joining. And be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. Visit AUSA.org for more information. And keep it locked right here for all Army Matters and for next week's episode with Soldier Today. Have a great Army Day.